recording from uh, on YouTube. Uh, welcome all to our second uh, seminar on youth studies. We are here with Demet Lucas and Anagret Ward. Thank you uh, all for your participation and a special thank to Anagret and Demet for accepting our invitation. It is very nice to be with you. Uh, youth studies is a burning issue. We will be always discussing. It, uh, it's a very debatable area of study. And we will start with Demet today, Demet Lukusu. Uh, I will read uh, her bio, but I would like to um, thank her very much firstly. And she is one of the most productive scholar uh, in Turkey on youth issues. Uh, and it is very um, privileged for us to have the uh, opportunity to listen to her today. So I will uh, start reading her short bio. Uh, she is a professor of sociology at Yeditepe University, uh, Istanbul, Turkey, where she is also working as the chair of the department. She received her PhD in sociology from Ecole de Haute uh, Etude and uh, Sciences Sociales uh, in Paris. Sorry for my French, by the way, France in 2005. She is the author of Turkey the Gençlik Miti, 1980 Sonrası Türkiye Gençliği. The Meat of Youth in Turkey, the post-1980 Youth in Turkey, and of Türkiye'nin 68'i, Bir Kuşağın Sosyolojik Analizi, Turkey's uh, 68, The Sociological Analysis of a Generation. She is also the co-editor of the edited volume in Turkish as Gençlik Halleri, 2000'li yıllar Türkiye'sinde genç olmak, The States of Youth, To Be Young in Turkey of the year 2000s, her areas of research include youth studies, social movements, sociology of everyday life, sociology of education, cultural studies, and internet studies. We are following her um, writings in our classes as well. I'm sure our students are also very excited to see and listen to you. Thank you. It's uh, your turn. Uh, the stage is yours, Demet. And uh, could you please, uh, for everybody, could you please uh, just uh, unmute yourself during the presentations. Uh, it is uh, better for the recordings and for uh, all all of us to listen carefully. Thanks. Thank you very much for this introduction. It it was so, so generous, and I feel so privileged to have uh, so kind words. Uh, from you, uh, and I'm also very happy to be uh, meeting all of you here, even though um, I wish that we were all in Izmir uh, holding this meeting face to face. Um, but still, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, I've already participated in the first uh, seminar that you held on childhood. Uh, so thank you for this. Uh, invitation. Uh, and now you can see that I'm not at all skilled with uh, the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, so you can see uh, that I have here uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but yet one of the disadvantages of uh, having the PowerPoint presentation uh, is that I cannot see all of your, uh, your faces. Uh, but still, I wanted to go over uh, the presentation uh, so that we can uh, just have an order and I can try to organize myself according to time, but we'll see if, if that will happen. Um, you will see that I'm, I'm not at all skilled, but um, uh, I, I will try to uh, follow my uh, presentation and, and discuss use uh, as an ambivalent uh, category. Uh, we, we propose uh, ambivalence as a key word, uh, even though our aim in this uh, session together with Anegret is to understand youth beyond myths and, and moral panics. 
I also know that you have already uh, started discussing uh, childhood. You have already started discussing childhood studies uh, with a very productive uh, session. Um, and you have already had the chance to talk about uh, moral panics. Uh, and you also had the chance to, to, to discuss uh, a biological category, which is usually uh, the thing that comes to mind when we say childhood or, or youth. Uh, but as you already started discussing it, uh, youth, childhood, adulthood, old age, these are not biological categories, or at least not just biological categories, but social categories uh, constructed by our societies. Um, dynamic categories, heterogeneous categories, etc. So, so th this is what we want to say. Uh, but I would like to say that I, I feel very happy uh, that one of the themes that you have chose uh, is youth, which is in fact my main area of research. Uh, Gül was so kind to talk about uh, the works uh, that I have uh, produced uh, some of them together with colleagues, uh, with, with friends. Uh, so youth is uh, sociology of youth, youth studies is my main area of research. Uh, so with the first session on childhood, especially with Denis Arzuk's uh, uh, presentation, you were left there uh, discussing how uh, agency of children are not recognized. And this is in fact, one of the things that are being uh, realized with uh, the childhood studies, recognizing uh, agency of, of children. Uh, so I know that Annegret is going to uh, discuss this issue of uh, Eurocentrism in youth uh, studies. So I think it is uh, important to uh, also make reference to a book that I use in my sociology of youth courses, Makers and Breakers, Children and Youth in Postcolonial Africa, an edited volume which tries to also uh, argue this main point of recognizing uh, agency of, of children um, and also of, of young people. Uh, as, as you know, most of the time, this is related with our adult centrism in our societies, that our societies are so adult centric all the rules of the game are determined by the adults. They are uh, the citizens of our uh, nation states. They are uh, the producers of our economies, etc. So the whole game in a way, or the whole modern system uh, as, it, uh, as it was uh, constructed uh, with the uh, industrial, modern industrial societies, it is constructed as an adult-centered uh, society, uh, somehow constructed around work, constructed around production, and the time in which you're not yet an adult is the time that you just train to be an adult. So that's the case with children, that's the case with young people. You are being trained to become the adult, but you're not adults yet. Um, so it, it seems like these, uh, the, the concepts of agency, subjectivity, uh, or the, the, the concepts of responsibility, these are all the concepts reserved for adults. Whereas uh, when you're uh, a child or when you're uh, a young person, uh, you're not yet into the real life because the real life begins with the adult age. You're just being uh, trained to become citizens. You're just trained to become adults of uh, the future. Uh, so I would argue that one of the important tasks of uh, childhood and, and youth studies is to argue uh, for this uh, recognition of agency 
of children and, and young people, which is already being addressed, which is already being discussed in the developing literature uh, that we have. So in order to, to talk about uh, use as an ambivalent category, but also to, to say how our societies are in fact adult-centered society in which uh, young people are not really uh, recognized as uh, people with difficulties, people under stress, uh, people under um, harsh circumstances. I wanted to make reference to a play uh, written by Florian uh, Zeller. Uh, so we have been discussing Florian uh, Zeller recently uh, because uh, he's also uh, the writer of the play, The Father, and then The Father, as you know, was filmed, uh, won the Oscars, uh, starring Anthony uh, Hopkins. So this is in fact a trilogy and the, the Sun is also uh, one of uh, the plays of that trilogy. And one of the, it, it, it is in fact one of the last plays that I watched on theater. And as a sociologist, you can imagine uh, that before the pandemic, it, it was really uh, very meaningful for me uh, as a sociologist to be watching plays, to be watching uh, movies, in uh, the movie theaters or in uh, in the theaters together with the audience because it is there that you can catch what the audience feels what the audience says etc uh, so unfortunately with the pandemic you know that we have been missing that and while preparing the this presentation i think i remember those uh those days and um uh, I remember, I remember what I felt while watching uh, the play. So the son, um, uh, the, the, as the main uh, character in the play, even though there you only see him at the back. Uh, so there, uh, the son Pierre, uh, the, the son uh, Nicola, uh, is in fact in a major depression. And uh, he is having difficult time explaining to his uh, parents um, they are divorced, uh, explaining to his, his parents that he's uh, suffering from major depression. So those of are familiar with depression studies, we know that it's already difficult for people in uh, suffering from depression to explain to their relatives, to their close friends, how much they are suffering. Uh, but yet, I think in the play, there was more to it because uh, there we are talking about uh, a young person, an adolescent during high school. Um, and it, it becomes even much more difficult for him to, to explain how he is feeling. So during the play, while watching with the audience, we have uh, two repeated lines uh, that we hear from uh, the son at two different occasions. Uh, he tells his, his parents uh, that it was much more easier when he was a child, but now the world, his life is much more complicated and he is suffering. And each time that he repeats this sentence, that life was much more easier, but now it's much more complicated. Um, I have witnessed the audience burst into laughter, uh, laughing loudly in a way announcing uh, that how can as a young person have a difficult life, uh, the life that you're uh, facing is just a rehearsal to the real life and you cannot have real problems. And, I, and as, a, as a youth researcher, I can say that that is one of the challenges of uh, the youth studies, explaining uh, that in, in fact, uh, young people have a life uh, and that 
they have uh, a subjectivity, that they have difficulties. And in that sense, it is difficult to explain uh, to uh, the people who think that they have, uh, as the adults, they had already passed through those stages of life. They have been a child once, they have been a young person once, so they know all about being young, so they, all, they know all about being a child. So I think that is one of the difficult cases. And what really complicates the issue with the youth is that, I mean, compared with the childhood that you have already studied um, in the first seminar, youth uh, in the first workshop, uh, youth uh, in addition is um, defined, considered as a transitory stage. It's a transitory stage between childhood and adulthood. And we know that in our societies, we have all these issues, uh, we have all these concepts related with, with uh, childhood. Um, we have all those uh, ideas about what it means to be an, an adult, even though all those concepts and all of those ideas around childhood and adulthood needs to be questioned and, and criticized. But yet we feel like we have an idea about those, uh, those concepts, but what is complicated about youth uh, that it is um, a stage in life in which you're not a child and you're not yet an adult. So it is um, this uh, transition which makes it much more difficult. And this transition in a way tells us once again that our real goal is to become an adult. So you have just one direction and you're not yet an adult. Um, so a sociologist that we all love and, and use in our work, Pierre Bourdieu, um, as in fact, uh, as a neo-Marxist name, he, he's, he's quite harsh, for example, in discussing uh, the youth category, which uh, he says in one of his interviews, youth is just the word, and he um, underlines the difference between uh, working class youth and uh, the middle class or the bourgeois youth. Uh, and for the student category, which is most of the time composed of the bourgeois class, if we look at the statistics that he worked on uh, since the 1960s, uh, we see that um, young people can be said to be living in a social no man's land. And that gives them a certain privilege. Uh, they want to be treated as children in some cases. And uh, for other cases, they want to be treated as, as adults. So you, you can see that um, as someone who underlines the importance of class over a category like youth, uh, Pierre Bourdieu underlines that youth does not mean much as there are different worlds of youth. So in that sense, youth becomes just a word. But on the other hand, we all know uh, that all those concepts, all those categories that we work on are just words. And in that sense, all those categories are quite heterogeneous categories and there are different worlds of youth as whereas there are different worlds of uh, women, there are different worlds of working class, there are different worlds of uh, bourgeoisie, etc. So it seems that all of our, our uh, concepts becomes just a word uh, if we focus on uh, on that uh, heterogeneity. So in that sense, I really believe that youth can be an important keyword for discussing what is going on in our societies, for understanding um, the difficulties faced with young people, as well as for understanding the different political projects and how those different political projects view uh, youth.
Uh, so that's uh, youth being a transitory stage and becoming difficult to understand whether youth uh, is, uh, is youth a, a childhood category? Is it um, an adulthood? What does this in-betweenness mean? Uh, for us, for, for researchers. Another important problem or an important challenge we face is related with representations of youth, uh, which also takes us to this issue of dominant discourses on youth. Uh, so today I have been uh, giving reference to my sociology of youth course, and one of the things, uh, one of the sources uh, that we uh, look at during uh, sociology of youth course is this edited book uh, by Joanna Wine and Rob White, Rethinking Youth. Uh, first published in the 1990s, but then uh, published in, in different versions. Uh, so I really like to start the Sociology of Youth course with the introductory chapter from this edited book, The Concept of Youth. And there uh, we see that the authors discuss how uh, not use is uh, use is an ambivalent category, and there are in fact different paradoxes around the, the use category if we look at the dominant discourses. So on the one hand, you have this use as the future discourse, which is also uh, very popular and very dominant in the Turkish case as well, um, which uh, takes us again back to that history of youth uh, in which we know that youth as a modern category is a product of our modern institutions, um, especially of school and there the national education system tries to construct the future generations of the nation state of the Republic, if we are talking about uh, the Turkish case, and it becomes indispensable uh, to give uh, a good training, a good national education uh, to all those future adults of the Republic, of the nation state. So you have there this use as the future um, discourse, which is very powerful. Um, and that discourse also makes use uh, for all the modern categories, a for all the modern ideologies, a symbol. So when we look at the history of all those modern ideologies, you see that they choose youth as their symbol. Uh, so if you want to construct the future, if you want to shape the future, you have to shape your youth. Uh, but not only we have this discourse discussing youth as the future, but you have also this um, opposite uh, representation of youth, which sees youth as a threat, which sees youth as a problem. Uh, or if you would just look at the, the, the French uh, uh, explanation as a dangerous class, class dangerous. So it, it seems like not only youth represents the future, and in that sense becomes an important uh, part of all the modern ideologies and of modern states, but it also becomes something uh, that needs to be controlled, that needs to be surveilled upon, uh, that there is always something that might be dangerous about, about youth. That is, of course, uh, also related with this issue of trying to construct the future, trying to eliminate all those threats and risks for the future. But it also takes us back to this issue of 
youth being a heterogeneous category in the sense that on the one hand, we have this ideal youth that all the nation states, all the modern ideologies tries to construct, but there is also this category of youth that needs to be disciplined, that needs to be uh, somehow controlled, um, and it, it, if necessary, um, punished. Uh, so in that sense, it seems like even though they seem to be two opposite uh, discourses or to opposite representations of views, it is possible to say that in fact they represent the two sides of the same coin. And I would argue that if you look at the history of youth in Turkey, we know that it, it worked together. On the one hand, there is what I would call the myth of youth that is very present even today in the political culture, as well as in the society. But there is also this idea, this uh, notion, uh, seeing youth as, as a dangerous uh, category. What complicates the issue is that uh, youth with our consumer cultures, with our consumer societies, is also becoming a commodity and in that sense is also becoming independent of age. So we are being told in our consumer cultures that it's looking young, uh, having the image of a young uh, person is nothing to do with age, nothing to do with biology, uh, but it is a commodity. It's something uh, that you can uh, purchase, you can easily, uh, in that sense, uh, see the commodification uh, of the youth category, which again, um, somehow uh, complicates the issue. So all that takes us, and that's how I'm uh, concluding um, my presentation, that takes us to this challenge of, of youth studies, that um, at the end of the day, youth is such a heterogeneous category. And in that sense, we have to try to understand youth in its uh, heterogeneity. And it is this heterogeneity that can take us to different directions so that youth studies uh, can easily go to uh, different uh, directions, make links with different uh, studies, um, since there are different factors influencing the experiences of being young, including class, ethnicity, gender, but not only those, uh, but all those uh, other elements that come with it. Uh, so I can end my presentation here. But then I don't know how to. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could stop the. Uh, maybe Duygu, if Duygu shares her screen. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Demet. This was very rich and inspiring uh, presentation to rethink youth studies and youth as a category in itself. Uh, and uh, I, I have some uh, burning question afterwards, hopefully. <laughs> uh, not questions, but some thoughts uh, already. It was very inspiring. Thank you very much. So uh, we will uh, go on with Anagret uh, and Elif. Yes. <laughs> Hello again, everyone. Uh, Demet, thank you very much for a very thought provoking pro presentation for somebody like me who is a total stranger in this field. And it gives me great pleasure to to introduce Annegret Ward. Uh, Annegret uh, studied at Tübingen, Marburg, and Bosphorus universities before doing her PhD at Hamburg.
Charles Schmidt University. Uh, she works in the intersection of academia, civil society, and administration. Uh, she is current. She is currently at as works. She uh, she is an education manager. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't put it into words. At uh, Stuttgart uh, municipality, where uh, uh, she coordinates a network which emphasizes education for uh, sustainable development. Uh, she is also an associate researcher at Goethe University, where she taught in the past. Uh, her academic research uh, strives to change the Eurocentric uh, research on youth, and uh, for that purpose, I suppose, <laughs> she did research on Turkey too, and uh, she focused on the potentials of focal youth policy and youth participation, and for that purpose, she worked in youth studies uh, at the uh, youth studies unit in Bilgi University. Uh, Annegret, tell me if I'm missing anything. <laughs> uh, so we are looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Edith, uh, for the introduction um, and also for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be here um, visiting uh, Izmir virtually and also getting uh, to know uh, your faculty for me also like the pandemic has really um, yeah brought me far away from Turkey in a sense and I feel this is like now again a first uh, encounter and a great possibility yeah to uh, yeah, restart uh, conversations and I'm also very happy that you choose uh, yeah youth um, studies as a subject um, and give yeah as the opportunity to uh, reflect together. Um, so I will now also um, start my presentation. Give me a second. So, um, yeah, so my presentation also um, will touch upon the general topic on uh, the uh, ambivalence of youth. Um, it's also discussed like how, um, yeah, society's uh, perspectives on youth can be very ambivalent. And um, my experience by <laughs> as a youth researcher also shows that, um, yeah, researchers' perspectives on youth can be quite ambivalent and that also we, we as researchers need to reflect our position. Um, but uh, before I start uh, with this topic, some of you might uh, ask why on earth is this German person <laughs> connected to Turkey? Um, why is she interested in uh, youth in Turkey? And um, yeah, I just want to share a bit of my story because also the sto my story is very interlinked with um, my learnings and what I'm going to tell you. So actually I'm like one of uh, the Erasmus generation. Um, when I was a student, I, I yeah, choose to come to Istanbul in, in the year 2007 and 2008. So that's already quite a long time ago. <laughs> and actually like these uh, years, like 2007 to 2010, I've yeah, I've been an Erasmus student. I have made a voluntary service at uh, Youth Studies of Biggie University. Actually, um, I also entered the, the field of youth research in Turkey through uh, Demet because I attended uh, her class as an <laughs> Erasmus student. And she also was the one who introduced me to yeah, Youth Studies Unit and yeah, um, youth organizations in Turkey. And, um, in, in these times, I also worked in a youth center. Um, um, it was back then existing. It doesn't exist anymore. This was called Kısa Daiga, and it was located in Ali Beyköy in Istanbul, uh, near by the big university campus. And so I got to know uh, lots of volunteers. I got to know uh, teenage youth. And yeah, by being together with them, I realized some things are very uh, similar to my experiences in Germany, but some things are also different. And this actually motivated me then also to pursue an academic career and um, yeah, start a PhD. 
So in the past years, I've been, yeah, like um, Elif already said, uh, I've been partly at universities or at think tanks, but now also in working, I've been working in civil society and now in administration. And I try to merge all these different uh, perspectives. Um, so um, I want to start out to give you uh, a little introduction on uh, yeah, my work uh, on my PhD, which I actually started in 2010 and I just finished it. This is if you always are in between um, research and practice, uh, things uh, take a bit longer. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, um, the book will be out. Uh, it's not very long, so it's a very nice opportunity also to share um, some insights and um, for me I was looking on everyday practices on teenage youth in Istanbul because when I was uh, looking at the state of art back in these days I realized lots of research on youth in Turkey is mostly focused on young adults or um, university students and I was interested in so much knowledge so I decided yeah to take um, this age category um, so my leading question is, uh, how do youth from different social backgrounds um, negotiate and uh, cre create, or you can al could also say construct youth in their everyday uh, practices? And um, Demet already also um, made the point that youth is a heter heterogeneous category. So. For me, that was also a starting point to say, okay, I don't want to make a case study on one specific milieu on youth, but I would like to choose different milieus so that in through the comparison, I would also gain a new uh, yeah, knowledge on youth. So um, I, I conducted youth group discussions with youth attending private high schools, um, Alman, Lissesi, and like, yeah, so also this, um, this kind of high schools. Vocational high schools, Meslek Lissesi, conducted group discussions of, with youth who left school after back then and uh, eight years of primary school. This has changed after 2012, but back then, yeah, so it's working youth or what um, also Demet is calling F Küsse. So, and what was very interesting because I started out um, wanting to. Um, yeah, research youth in Turkey, but then I understood in order to understand youth in Turkey better, I have to also learn more about my position as a youth researcher in Germany and um, reflect upon the approaches I could use to, um, yeah, uh, so yeah, what kind of categories are in my mind and uh, are they, um, the right um, perspectives to really gain an understanding on, on what uh, the youth in Turkey are experiencing. And so when I started to look out for concepts and, uh, and there are used mostly then of course in Germany, I, I realized I cannot use these concepts because some, in, in a way they're also normative and they're, they're made for rather like Western European context. So, um, and in this, in this way, I had to step back, uh, um, had, had to take one step back and really reflect and do more research on, um, on youth concepts. And I also, uh, I would like to quote a, a person who, which um, Demet already mentioned, um, Johanna Wynn, uh, the researcher, I think she's based in Australia, which is also very interesting because Australia is like, it's very near to Asia in, in a way they also have, of course, this connection to Western, uh, in, um, yes. Um, so she, I think she's quite also aware of these heterogeneous categories and the problem and pitfalls of Eurocentricity. So, um, she says like the, the, the youth concepts or like in conceptual frameworks in general create truth, truths, and they naturalize particular ways of thinking. And in this, they create a discursive frameworks within children and youth are under, understood and administered. 
so yeah, youth concepts are in a way predefining the way we look at youth. And uh, in this sense, I would uh, like to share some learnings and ways how I dealt um, with this challenge. Um, so the first lesson is that I felt like we need, there is a need um, for non-essentialist youth theory. I need, um, yeah, concepts uh, without, um, yeah, normative uh, propositions. Oh, sorry. I also have challenges in dealing with the presentation. Um, so, um, I developed an approach which I uh, call uh, youth as an interactive con creation or construction process. Um, secondly, I also felt, uh, yeah, I learned a lot about the um, potential of comparative approaches in youth research. And at, at the end, I would like to also point out um, some of the potentials of research on youth in Turkey, in this specific social co historical context for further youth uh, theory development. Um, by thinking on the about the time, I will focus on uh, lesson one and three. And uh, if you're interested, we can then also discuss more about comparative approaches afterwards. So now, uh, non-essential youth concepts. I would like to discuss with you why this is important and yeah, which approaches and concepts are useful to research heterogeneous youth in a global perspective, not focus in yeah, one nation state. Um, and for me, really eye-opening was a, a look at um, demographies. And what you can see here is like an overview on youth and different uh, parts of the world and it uh, shows on, on the one hand um, the situation and on uh, of 2017 but there's also a prospection on the situation 50 so you can actually see that there's one world region where most of the youth lives and will and this will even expand and this is sub-saharan africa so this is actually, this is, this is the place in the world where youth takes place. <laughs> so, and there's also, and you see South Asia and Southeast Asia, East Asia and Oceania. And these are also um, areas with a high uh, youth population, but until 2050, this um, population will decrease rapidly. And then <laughs> you can see like, uh, um, of youth population, which is in Western Europe and North Africa. So, and you can really see that actually from a youth um, perspective, like Europe is minority world. <laughs> it's like, it's in terms of dem uh, yeah, demographies, it's, it doesn't really count, right? But then if we think about um, the creation of youth theory, most of the youth theories have been developed in the 20th century in Europe and the United States. So, and then it's very easy to ask the questions, are the concepts we are using, are they suitable to, yeah, um, understand the global realities and heterogeneity of youth? I think we question if this is possible and there is a high need if we want to be aware of youth reality uh, yeah, in, in a global perspective, we should really think of, yeah, are the, how should we uh, further uh, concepts? Are they enough? Do we have to search or develop new concepts uh, to understand these heterogeneities? So, and then, of course, there's the question, so what does this, uh, what's the connection between uh, these demographies and Turkey? It was not easy for me, like, to find out where we should locate Turkey in this chart. <laughs> but uh, what I did um, in the course of my PhD, I, um, I had a look on the uh, historical development of employment rates, uh, 
uh, enrollment rates, school enrollment rates. And I, here you can see the enrollment rates, in, enrollment rates between 1997 and 2015. Um, I, uh, this is what I use for my PhD, so it's not actualized, but I think it's, it, it's, it doesn't show the current state, but still, I think uh, it's, it's still, it goes still in the same direction. So you see um, on the um, vertical line, it's the enrollment rates, horizontal line, um, the historical development, and you see enrollment rates of primary school, high school, and university. And what is very, um, yeah, or what stands out is that, of course, Turkey has, has had this quantitative expansion of education in, since the 80s massively. And um, also, Demet pointed it out, this is also like a way how society constructs youth. And these massive changes are uh, like, system has of course then also changed the way youth is constructed is constructed or the way youth uh, is lived and and this is also like it's 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 a global trend it's not just a trend um, for Turkey what is interesting maybe from a western <laughs> or from a German perspective is um, the enrollment rates in high school and which we are also aware of like in 2015 and 16, there's still 20% of youth not continuing uh, their uh, transition to adulthood in school. But at the age of 13 or 14, they leave school. And one can ask, what, how, how do they, uh, they experience youth? And, and how do they, yeah, how, what is their way into adulthood? And this is something which is very unusual, at, at least for Germany, because we have like on 100% enrollment rates in, in Germany. But on the other hand, in African countries, like um, young people dropping out of school, leaving schools at the age of 13 and 14, that's the prevalent category. So that's the normality. And this is also like, a, a Eurocentric perspective to say actually the normality should be everyone is in school until the, or the age of 18. No, if you look at it from, at it from a global perspective, it's totally not the case if you look at the demographics. So that's why, why I think um, Turkey is a very interesting example because there's on the one hand a lot of young people who um, make their way in adult, into adulthood accompanied by education, but there's also a big portion of youth who is not. So actually in Turkey, you have to find a way to, to, deal, or to deal with lots of different also youth concepts, the ones who are appropriate for uh, uh, educational youth, but also the, uh, who are suitable for working youth or F. Kusslade. So um, now I would like to share you some of the thoughts or like some of the lessons or solutions I found uh, um, uh, on how to deal uh, with youth concepts and youth theory. So um, I, for me, actually in Germany, because most of German research youth research in Germany also focuses actually on, on youth in Germany and there, there's some international youth research but not so much so I felt the need of developing an approach that suited um, yeah for my PhD so um, I developed a concept called youth as a construction process and um, I take um, perspective from ethno, ethno methodology which focuses on um, everyday practices on of um, habitus theory of body or sociology of knowledge who uh, of Mannheim who focus on the tacit knowledge but also of uh, rela relational sociology who thought that yeah construction processes or yeah it's it's creating uh, constructing youth it's a very complex processes you have to take into account places you have to take into account time you have to take into account different actors and um yeah 
so um, in as a construction process also means we, I, I'm not looking at, on the question, I'm not asking the question, what is youth? Because then it would be already predefined and we cannot do it because it's too heterogeneous, but rather ask the question, how is youth constructed and negotiated? So my assumption is that multiple actors, this could be youth, peer groups, could be teachers, could be parents, it could be the laws. And it's, it's embedded in their everyday practices, in, in the way of doing, youth is being constructed, constructed. And it's not something which is accompanied by harmony, but actually it, it, sometimes it's a fight, fight. So in everyday practices, multiple actors, and thereby construct very context-specific forms of youth. So, and then by looking at all these youth theories and youth con concepts, I realized I cannot use just one concept because constructing youth is so complex and actually you need to have like several youth concepts in your pocket. So if you are like, if you work with empirical material, then you have the flexibility then also to choose and to, to combine the concepts which you find in the empirical um, yeah, material. So for me, I have been looking at more like conventional youth theories, like institut institutionalization of the youth phase, social change, generational order, youth culture, inequality, intersectionality, and space. But there, there are more. For instance, I haven't um, um, taken into account post-colonial approaches or the, the question of power. So um, part is open. So for me, anyone can add anything they need. And, and it's always according to uh, the, the, the youth you are researching, because it's so heterogeneous, you have to stay flexible. And um, yeah, so in a way, having these approaches in, in your pocket, it helps you to sensi be sensible and be sensitized for different dimensions of this complex and interactive process of negotiating and constructing, constructing youth. And this sounds now very theoretical. <laughs> Um, and I, um, I tried also to condense, like by looking at these approaches. So, what's the, the what could be the leading questions if I have like group discussions or interviews or ethnographic transcripts? So, what should I ask the empirical um, um, material? So, um, for me, for instance, space was very important because I thought like it's also very interesting to see like to first check where are the youth. And what do they do in this everyday spaces? Because also like, for instance, um, um, privileged youth in Istanbul attending um, private high schools, they, they, they are at very different social spaces uh, than for instance, um, working class youth, right? So one question would be, um, where are young people in their everyday life and which places are relevant to them? And then by looking at their everyday practices in the spaces, how do they deal with norms and expectations in their everyday practices? And how do they position themselves? Would they uh, take a counter position? Would they uh, adopt what is being said, uh, what is being expected from them? And then also look at their, um, of course, of, uh, on their uh, possibilities and restraints. So what are their, um, different options for action to realize maybe their own um, yeah, orientations. Dear Elif, <laughs> I, I totally forgot to look at uh, the time. Uh, I, I was going to have... interrupt you in two minutes. Uh, so we are, okay. we are already in two okay. minutes. Okay, yeah. then I will skip a lot. <laughs> Actually, I also have brought some um, quotes, but maybe we can come to them in, in the discussion. But like, then I like to sum up and um, point out um, some potentials of uh, research on youth 
in Turkey. So what I have been um, yeah, trying to show you with um, the historical development of in employment enrollment rates is that Turkey has a lot, yeah, there is a lot of heterogeneous youth in, in, in Turkey and by using or comparative approaches, I think there's a high potential of critical discussing and further developing conventional youth concepts and assumptions. But because by developing your research question and or like looking at um, youth concepts, you, you, you will realize, is it, is it feasible? Is, is it useful to understand everyday practices of F Kizlare or not? Um, and that's also um, the second point for me. I also did, um, because I uh, had in my sample, I used from, uh, yeah, working uh, youth and F Kuzlare, and I realized the existing youth concepts, it's, it's not working in a way. The, 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 I, I couldn't use these concepts to, to interpret what I found in the, in the material. So, um, I think there's also a lot of potential for research on youth in Turkey to really look at these categories of youth outside the cities, working youth, and uh, yeah, and start like the search of identifying theoretical concepts to better understand practices and orientations of youth outside the education system. Yeah, so far from my side, um, thank you very much for your attention and I'm very curious about uh, your questions and the discussions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Annegret. I'm sorry you skipped those slides. I was very curious. We, we had 20 minutes, but we had time actually, but you <laughs> just oh, okay. we already had 10 more minutes. But uh, but maybe in the discussions, okay. if you want, yeah, I can sure. then show you one of the quotes happening. So, yes, thank you again. And if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, please write in the chat box or just raise your hand and unmute yourself. If nobody has a burning question, I have one. <laughs> just I will wait for a second. Okay, then I can ask my question. Actually, I thought about this. After, this is a question to you both, uh, I suppose. <laughs> uh, this came to my mind first after the, the Mets talk and then after Anegret's uh, impressive image about the population of the youth uh, and how it will increase in the sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so I, this might be a cliche <laughs> to you, but we hear old people, adults, and uh, talking about youth as like a foreign land that they had never been to, like that they had never experienced. And now the youth is by itself a category that they had never been, <laughs> let's say. Uh, so this foreign land is actually, uh, so that's the question. The question is, is also a conceptual thing, but probably a physical thing in the future because of the youth will be somewhere else in Africa. And um, you know what I mean? It's like a different, I don't know how to propose this, but uh, the more thinking may be focused on this new uh, place. So what do you think about youth as a foreign land? I mean, I of course borrow these words from another scholar. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, if you, if you want to start, I, I, I continue. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, in fact, uh, this uh, symbolism around whether uh, youth is a foreign land also made me think about another ambivalence around youth. That on the one hand. Um, when we listen to adults speak about uh, young people, young generation, on the one hand, they act as if they all know about it mm -hmm. uh, on some occasions. 
But on some other occasions, they say, oh, we were so different. And now the young generation is, is yeah, so different yeah. from mm-hmm. us. Yeah, that's so, what I meant. <laughs> so I think we, we have it both that mm-hmm. on the one hand, um, I mean, you don't need to be an expert to understand mm-hmm. the young generation. Everyone understands the young generation because there have been young ones. Uh, mm. But on the other hand, there is this idea that we were much more dedicated, we were much more hardworking, or we were much better compared to this young generation, which is not. Um, but I think especially now, if, if we turn to, to Turkey, especially with these Generation Z uh, debates, um, I, I think you're right on the sense that we tend to think ah now it's like aliens there's this generation z and they're so alien to us as if they were not socialized in this country as if they are not a part of our family etc so uh in that sense i think it is it is very interesting uh to see how uh the popular uh concepts uh around generation are evolving or changing in in the Turkish media, including uh, the social media. Uh, But coming back to uh, what Anegret was saying about uh, how our demographies uh, are changing. So I think that is uh, very important. We tend to ignore uh, that demography is there and we are going Um, through important uh, demographic um, changes uh, because, I mean, our modern uh, industrial societies were was all uh, constructed around uh, a demography in which uh, the young generations play an important role. And in that sense, uh, especially after the Second World War with the baby boom uh, generation, uh, we, are, uh, we are used to living in societies in which uh, young people have an important percentage, have an important share. Uh, and now, since uh, previously, since the last 10, 20 years, uh, this is changing. It started to change in Europe, and um, ho- hopefully, uh, we are uh, having some very interesting research trying to understand the aging of societies, uh, aging societies, and what it means for uh, for our societies. But for Turkey, for example, this is a new phenomenon. Um, I, I remember some research, some reports underlining how Turkey has this demographic window of opportunity uh, till 2010s, but after that, the population will begin to, to age. And, and now we, we begin to, to experience this. Uh, but unfortunately, what's we hear in uh, the popular uh, or political discourses is uh, is to say uh, that uh, young people are not getting uh, married at earlier ages. They don't want to have children, etc. So as if it is all uh, the, the young generation's fault. Um, and on the other hand, we have all those uh, societies in which young people have an important share in the populations. Turkey is still one of them, even though uh, the society began to, to age. There is the Middle East case. There is the sub-Saharan Africa, as uh, Anegret said. Um, so com- this comparative approach, uh, Anegret uh, underlined, uh, is in fact very important to, to understand that when we talk about the young generation, um, in fact, we need to also uh, underline uh, in which society, in what part of uh, the world, uh, in order to better understand their uh, experiences and how they, they also view the future. Uh, so your question was not an easy question, and I don't know if uh, I could answer it, but those are some of the things that came to my mind 
uh, while listening to your question, but I'm sure Anegat has more to, to add on to that. Thank you very much, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So yes, very interesting indeed, like this, um, um, yeah, the term youth as a foreign land. And I think I can answer it on, on uh, two levels. First, like on a very conceptual level, but also on the case of Turkey. So because what we, what also um, Demet pointed out, youth is a social construct. And um, what I'm trying to, uh, uh, to explain with this context, uh, concept of youth as a construction process, actually each, each youth is constructing youth by themselves a different way of being young by interacting and with uh, in generational orders with adults. And uh, so in a way it, it's youth is totally a foreign land and, and we really need to um, look very context specific what kind of landscapes we can explore. And then on the other hand, also what Demet meant, like in the case of Turkey, you see uh, yeah, social, social change, you see the change of demogra demographies. And um, so what have been, what the, the, the chart with enrollment may, uh, rates has, uh, has shown that uh, youth in Turkey has changed rapidly. And this is also has been made um, clear by, uh, um, by Leila Nesi or by Demet Lukesli by describing the, uh, um, yeah, the, the upcoming of youth culture in a way, right? Uh, people uh, got, uh, young people got tools to express themselves, to find their own identity. So, and you can put together like this youth culture development with the educational exp education expansion of Turkey. And then you see, I mean, youth 20 years ago or 30 years ago in 1980s has nothing to do with youth nowadays. And I think there's still, at least my research like on youth, teenage youth in Istanbul, from 10 years ago, we have to say, I found, I, it, I've, it, it kind of showed me that um, the privileged youth, that there is in this intergenerational continuity in a way. They went to um, private high schools because their parents, they, they, they're rich or wealthy enough to send them to high school. So it's the experience of older and younger generation are not as far away as, for instance, um, in, 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 in maybe lower middle class or social milieus who are really like hit by the educational expansion. So parents who went to primary schools, but their kids because of the educational expansions now went, go to, um, to high school and they even have the aim or the possibility to go to university. And here there's the, this intergenerational discontinuity like because their parents, they cannot show, like the, the, the life orientation of the parents is not valid for the young generation anymore. And that's also what I found like in the group discussions that at least in teenage times, uh, the, the private high school students, they're more about repro reproducing class, like keeping their standards and following the path of their parents. Maybe it changed when they go to university, but at least in high school, it's about, it's not about being creative or like, it's, it's about keeping the stat status quo at, at least on the habitual, like in, in, the, in the implicit knowledge. But young people in vocational high schools, they, they're really fighting and they're like, they have traditional neighborhoods on, at the one hand, and then they leave these traditions and they go to other city parts, they go, um, they go to, um, to high schools and meet new people outside their neighborhoods and in, in their classes. And there is like, you see the search for new and trying to make sense of their situation and find new life orientations, which, which would suit to the two, to 2010s or to the 2020s. So that's also what, like, it helped me to overcome like, an Eurocentric uh, assumption to say actually like the transformational power of youth culture is not necessarily only in upper classes because sometimes we assume they have time for hobbies, they can, they have time to learn about new things. 
sometimes they're they're also like yeah trying to reproduce on the other hand like for this vocational school students they're really because of this discontinuity they strive for transformation but then actually there's a lack of um of recognition so they're also not always successful in their strive for new and for this transformation and of course they're like also the burdens of inequality thank you very much are there any other questions uh, i Do can go and I, give it I, I, actually, my, um, it, it, I'm not sure if I can make a question out of it, but I was thinking about this representation of youth as well, especially after the mass uh, presentation and after this question. Uh, and I would uh, like to uh, discuss it a little bit more. Uh, I will try uh, to uh, uh, transfer my thoughts, but I'm not sure if I can ask a question out of it. So it is um, not... Um, as they met talk about youth as a transition period that it is uh, and also an uh, emphasized lack of recognition as inequalities uh, experienced in the, uh, by young people but uh, when we think about um, this uh, they met uh, three points of uh, representation uh, young youth as a commodity, youth as a threat, and youth as a uh, domination, area of domination and control. Uh, it's uh, very ironic to see, um, like, as uh, adults, but who, uh, who we are also, even uh, now, uh, old people, uh, like, uh, in the past, we call them old people, but now they are the middle age people <laughs> of this era, like people as in the in their 60s, they can also claim I'm still young. So being young uh, is something that we are all longing for. We are not a foreign state of being, but missed all the time, uh, miss opportunity and lack of recognition. Uh, during that real period of <laughs> youth, but um, so it was uh, uh, for uh, youth as a transition metaphor, uh, like you cannot really fulfill that stage uh, of life. You are not child, but you are aiming to be an adult. So you are not uh, experiencing it full, fully, but then after that period, that real period in life, uh, you uh, longing for that period again. So it is very ironic and it is, it's, uh, sounds like uh, a way of controlling uh, through uh, consumption and making enhancing that um, youth as a commodity because you can never grasp it totally uh, even though you are at that uh, age described as youth, mm -hmm. you cannot fulfill mm -hmm. because since you are um, trying to be adult in that stage mm -hmm. anyway, but after that period, you are longing for <laughs> being young again, but you already missed that period. It's, it's very ironic and no question out of it. <laughs> if you, if you want to talk about a little bit more, I would appreciate, but it is, uh, it is lovely uh, thinking about about it uh, yeah yeah thank you thank you very much in fact it seems again uh that there is uh, this again this paradox around uh, youth on on the one hand um it seems uh that all those myths uh, around youth also uh, bring a charm with it um, and in in that sense uh, even though there is this sinister part related with with youth uh, uh, seeing youth as as dangerous as a threat etc uh, this charm of uh, the myth of youth is is so strong um, that we 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 long for it and we we claim that we are we are still young uh, 
Um, but in, in that sense, I think uh, there is so much also to learn from um, aging society studies, old age uh, studies in, uh, in the sense that not only uh, youth and, and childhood is a modern construct, but also how we view old age uh, changes with our mo modern societies and it also changes uh, lately with our late modernity or reflexive modernity or hyper modernity, how you like to uh, to call it. Uh, for example, in the traditional society, we had this uh, concept, concept, concept of uh, old age as uh, as a very positive thing in the sense that it it represents wisdom it represents experience so you learn from the experiences of the old you learn from the experiences of the usta uh, master if you think about this usta chuak ilishkisi this master apprentice uh, relationship um, for example whether you're in craftsmanship or in religious uh, education or if you were talking about learning to cook this experience um, from from the old is something uh, very valuable um, and in that sense it demonstrates the difference between the traditional conception of education and, and modern um, education um, or the, the education uh, that you receive now from uh, YouTube videos, how you learn to, to cook or how you learn to do makeup from YouTube videos if we are talking about the young generation of, of today. So it seems like it, it, it really changes. So in that sense, it's a dynamic category. And how it is viewed in the modern societies is that uh, once you can no longer work, when you can no longer be productive, uh, you're being retired, uh, you're considered as old. And in that sense, it seems like it, it, it became something as, as a disease that you try to prevent from happening to you because you still want to stay in this uh, society as an active part of that society. And with the consumer culture, of course, we are be being told that you can prevent this. So it's not all about ideology. It's not all about biology. It's not all about uh, something very natural, but it's something that you can prevent. Uh, so in that sense, if you uh, have a healthy diet, if you have a healthy life, if you do enough sports, you're going to look young. And uh, even if wh whatever your age is, you're going to look healthy and also fit and also young. This is on you. So it seems like it, it is, again, becoming a do-it-yourself biography in a way, and it becomes your choice to be an active member of that society or to be uh, included in that part of, uh, in that section of the society, which is usually seen from an economic lens as a burden on, on the society. Uh, so I think some part of this longing for, for youth and youth becoming a community is very much related with how we view old age and how we try to, to prevent it. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I think uh, you're very right to, to demonstrate how there are all these myths around, around youth and we, we have a longing for it. Thank yeah, you. Um, okay, yeah, so good. You, you were referring to um, youth as a transition phase and of something like in between, uh, not, any, not anymore a child, not uh, an adult yet. And in a way, um, then youth has a specific goal. It's becoming an adult, right? And um, Actually, oh, your 
yeah, your elaborations also inspired me to think or to rethink a bit about my material. And I could now use the chance to um, show um, one quote. And uh, it's, it's about like, how do young people actually envision their future? Like, how do they see the end? Or how do they see the next steps of their trans transitions? And they're uh, also like these different youth uh, I talked to, they have very different perspectives. And so, for instance, the privileged youth uh, attending private high schools, they have already very clear ideas on what's going to happen. I mean, for them, they were like in, uh, shortly before their exams, before SSA or Abitur in this case, and they said, I have to work hard af after SSA or like the university entrance exam, I will live my youth, I can relax. I might go to a good university, but I will skip all classes and enjoy my life. <laughs> but in the, in the end, I will have a good job, a secure job and kind of maybe live the life I know, but then here it's also very interesting because then they start to question, is that really what I want? Or maybe I want to have a career as a musician or actually I have taken um, cinema classes. I want to become a regisseur, but my parents actually want me to earn money. I think by, for privileged youth really this negotiation might start um, after high school. For uh, the uh, youth um, attending vocational school, for them, it was, they at least they could express wishes. Of course, their wishes was to have a successful exam and their wishes to go to university. But then their rea reality is uncertainty because they have a big wish, but it's not clear at all if they achieve what they want to do. But interestingly, in, in, in um, the discussions, they didn't have a plan B. It was all set for university and they didn't um, already develop um, alternative, alternative um, turn, uh, perspectives. For the working class youth or F Kisslerle, it was also very interesting because for them, I didn't find any future perspectives. And, 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 and this is also a challenge actually to see, okay, how, how do I describe this? If, because usually, everyone talks about, okay, youth is the preparation for adulthood, or like at least the education system, it gives you already like the next steps, it guides you through. But if you're out of the education system, there is, I mean, maybe there's milieu specific standard steps, but yeah, so I, I can now, sh if, if if it's okay, I can show this uh, quote and then maybe also it's very, I would be happy to hear your, yeah, your um, interpretation. So this is in, uh, in Turkish, I didn't uh, provide a, an English uh, translation, but I think it's okay for the context. And this is, for me, it's YF, that's me speaking, and UM and AM, that's two um, male, two young men uh, answering. and. So for me, that's also interesting. Like I have the assumption that <laughs> they should have like future plans. So I'm asking, do you have any other, because they didn't answer me the questions in the first place. So I'm asking again. And you see like they have problems answering me. So I am saying, okay, come on, tell her everything. She needs to have an answer. Let's be nice to her. <laughs> so UM is starting, oh yeah, I want to become a dad a good dad or like a good uh, family father. And that's a stereotype maybe. It's not really like something which is important from the milieu. And then AM is actually now explaining to me why they don't have future perspectives. And it's also interesting that it's he's not um, choosing like an individual um, explanation, but he's contextualizing it's in his social economic context. And he's pointing out, yeah, his lack, the lack of social capital in a way, uh, an economic capital. So they say, if we make plans, it's anyhow not going to work and we don't want uh, to feel these situations afterwards. So, öyle rüzgar nereye eserse biz 
oder Gideris. So, it's more. Yeah, and, 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 and in this last part, it's also there is not much agency, right? It's like what is happening to me that is going to be happening. It's not that they themselves make plans. Um, and this quote that I choose, it's like one example of many other quotes I found. And this is a quote where it's very explicitly where they try to explain me what's happening. But that was very like, I had this uh, group discussions for one and a half hours and they're not talking about the future, like in several group discussions, that's interest. That's yeah, that was very interesting for me. And for youth research in Germany, we had this discussion that one researcher divided like two di dimensions, like one, like there are young people who have this like very clear idea about their future. They're maybe, they are more adapted to society. They become, want to become adults faster. And then there's also like youth having this presence orientation. They're more like in, involved in the youth culture and they don't, it's more like a counterculture. They want to stay youth and they want to experience being young. And that's why they wait or postpone steps of becoming older. But I think it, that, that's not the case here. This is something different because it's also it's this working and so I'm also very interesting in, interested in your assumption or like your interpretation maybe also from the perspective of cultural studies how to interpret uh, this presence orientation. Thank you especially for the focus on uh, agency position I was also thinking uh, about it is uh, this representation of youth both uh, for young people and for adults or old people, let's say, uh, it is. Uh, it seems like it is all also very related to uh, controlling the agency position of people. Like for young people, uh, you you do not let them uh, fulfill their agency positions. You do not uh, give them enough space to uh, mm -hmm. make plans. Both for, for uh, uh, let's say upper class. Uh, young people and for the ones who are uh, more uh, lower class and uh, who has work, they uh, both do not have, uh, do not seem to have uh, lots of alternatives and do not uh, seem to have enough place, enough space to uh, fulfill their agency positions. And this representation of youth uh, for both for young people as a controlling and transition stage and for adults, uh, that, that is a missed land, uh, not a foreign, uh, but also a missed and longing state of being, but not uh, grasping uh, in your existence full, uh, fully. It is also uh, stealing some kind of agency from you. You want to be young, but you are not young. I mean, you can be active and subject as if you were fully young but you are not young anyway. So it is also very related that all these um, uh, constructions and uh, all these metaphors and representations seem to me very uh, related to controlling, I mean, power and controlling that agency positions in people through these representations of youth uh, itself. Very lovely conversation, inspiring ideas for me as well. Thank you. And there is one uh, question in the chat uh, station. Elif Bayram, would you like to read or ask your question yourself? Or um... Oh, okay, I can read. Um, I, I'm directly reading, okay. <laughs> I feel like I, if something changed in, uh, in a political way, lots of the problems of youth uh, would be solved or will be clearer in Turkey. And this much heterogeneous characteristics, characteristics of Turkish youth will become closer to European Union youth and can be controlled like EU youth uh, when we compare with Turkish youth. So when daily life is this much effective and most of people uh, more aware of the possibilities in their life and about the others, do you think the Turkish youth still should mostly be characterized by the old mayor ideological titles? coming from Turkish history, or they just need more opportunities to become more understandable about their expectations. Thank you very much. 
I, I think uh, you're referring to um, how some of the, the, the problems of uh, youth in, in Turkey uh, needs to be uh, solved. And, and in that sense, we need to have political debates around it, uh, right? Um, so this is something we have been uh, discussing among some uh, youth researchers. And Anne Grit, when she was here, she was also active in um, uh, discussing the importance of having um, a youth policy, an effective youth policy, both in the national and the local level for, for Turkey, but also for uh, all the, the, the societies. So it seems like uh, young people have some specific problems. We have been discussing that youth is a heterogeneous uh, category. So of course, those youth policies should be addressed uh, to uh, these different categories, should be addressing these different categories of, of youth. But there are also some, some common issues uh, that needs to be discuss and unfortunately uh, we don't see that happening in uh, in the Turkish case so I see in the first part of your question there's hope that some of those issues can easily be solved if uh, we have this um, uh, this political will and this political discussion around uh, around our problems and I think that the second part of your your question is um, also discussing how in the previous case that we have uh, the political culture and uh, the political actors are very much far away from uh, having this political debate and um, having the capacity to to solve these issues do not have such a uh, political agenda, they don't have a youth policy in mind for empowering the young generation. Uh, so you in that sense are uh, in a search for alternative uh, political positions. Uh, so I think this is what I hear from so many different young people, how they feel like the actual political parties, the actual political uh, leaders or actors, they are not really representing uh, the young generation and they're not really discussing the problems of uh, of the young generation. Uh, so I can say uh, that if I understand your question right, I, I agree with uh, the two sides of, of, of your question. Um, and I, I would say that I totally agree uh, that this is what we need in the Turkish case. Yeah, thank you, Demet. Actually, <laughs> you, you already have put it into really yeah, like good words. And I, I think my argument would also go into the same direction. What I could add is that I think I see um, like I still see an effect of like the reason uh, the, the youth research of the past 10 years in Turkey, because through all this youth research at universities at the one hand, but also youth research on more at think tank level and like the words or the, the work of Yada, it is Elif Öztürk is also here today. I mean, they actually, they, uh, they have been at the forefront actually on developing alternative perspectives on youth who are, which are, is more related to social rights and these uh, social categories. But then of course, knowledge and words itself, it's, it's not enough. So actually we have a lot of research results on youth in Turkey at hand, but then the challenge is yeah, how to bring it to the decision makers and to the political parties. And I think there's on the institutional structure side, um, there are still some challenges because there are not so many institutions who really focus on youth rights, like on like the kind of lobby organizations who then make the gap in between research and monitoring and, and yeah, the parliament, there, there are institutions, but if we compare it to Germany, 
I feel like in Germany, the, these discourses are only um, effective if there are much more stakeholders in society bringing this up and making it to a public discussion and then in a way forcing <laughs> um, parties and the government to take action. But still, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's also actors, the actors who are active in Turkey, I'm always impressed on how they continue and, and on how they yeah, bring in their perspectives. And in the end, also discussions like today, this is also one step of like keeping up discussing youth from this perspective. Yeah. And Elif is um, showing up, so maybe ah. <laughs> you can also tell something more. You're more ah. inside all this um, discussion. Okay. Uh, I can give some insights from this society, for example, when we made the research about it, uh, we saw that uh, there are very little amount of researches on the youth policies. Actually, the, uh, the youth categories, like you mentioned before, uh, we, we were focusing on the, the research to the need youth, uh, neither in employment and education training, and which is the uh, same category I think you mentioned because you're, you were talking about working youth and the youth uh, out of the education, education system. Uh, we saw the similar uh, issue in our uh, desktop research actually. Uh, so uh, it's for me like, I don't know, uh, it's like a loop for me because um, if there's no uh, enough researches about it, not much people going to talk about it. And when it's not on the table, uh, because of the, I don't know, lack of researches, I guess, uh, not much people working on this issue in the part of the civil society, I can say it. I don't know in the academia, but uh, from the think tanks and civil society part, uh, it's like a loop. Uh, and from the issue about the uh, future uh, expectations of the youth, uh, I saw the similar uh, uh, scenes uh, from the field. We, we saw that uh, young people don't have future expectations because they cannot see any future, uh, future option, actually. If there's an option, they're going to create a, some future expectation and choose in, inside of them. But if there is no options for them, how they can create a future uh, road for themselves? I can say these for now, maybe, but it was so uh, mind opening for me. I was thinking a lot of things when you are sharing the, your uh, conclusions, your research uh, results. Uh, when you're talking about the decreasing uh, demographic uh, population of the youth, I was thinking at the same time, uh, now they start to talk about the Generation C, COVID generation, and the youth also is going to change in a different way from we get used to. And also the number of the youth is going to decrease and how it's going to affect the uh, youth policies and the um, position of the youth inside of the policies. I was thinking a lot of things, but I cannot get it right to talk about it. But they, this, my, uh, this could be my uh, addition uh, comments of the topic. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, Duygu, you had a question? Or do you still have your question? Or <laughs> uh, actually, my question was partly answered, but it was it was. Um, I would like to hear more about the uh, kızları. So neither at work nor at school. So this category, maybe you want to uh, comment more about this research, and what about their transition and their future? That was my question. I think this goes to them. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't discuss uh, Eve because they're here in the presentation. I mean, I we discussed it together with uh, Kezban Chili, uh, sociologist from TED University. But it, it is thanks to you that you you mentioned them. 
Um, and it's it's very it, it was very important uh, that that you talked about the disadvantage used. You talked about the inequalities, etc. Uh, so it was great that uh, you mentioned uh, Eve Eve Um Why did we discuss? I, I will start briefly, and then I will let you uh, continue. Um, in fact, it is Elif uh, Öztürk was mentioning there is little research on uh, academ- in the Turkish academia on uh, young people neither in education nor employment. Um, and uh, we thought together with, with Kezban Çelik after finishing our PhDs, we wanted to uh, really do research on uh, these young women who are really at the bottom of the hierarchy of women and the hierarchy of youth. And uh, it seems like this is an ignored category. This is a silent category. Uh, so we wanted to do uh, qualitative research. We uh, started 10 years ago and, and uh, thankfully we had the opportunity to continue the research. Uh, we started with young women, but then we have realized that there are also young men who are outside of the education system and the employment. Uh, so we also tried to do, uh, extend our, our studies to, to young men. But then the statistics as well as our in-depth research demonstrate that there is a gender aspect of the need category uh, in Turkey, and it's mostly composed of of women. Uh, So uh, the the percentage of, of young women is twice as much as young men. And uh, also for uh, for women, it seems like they easily uh, accept their position as ev kuzi, which is different than their mothers, uh, housewives, uh, and they they say that they are ev um, kuzi. They can define themselves as as ev kuzi, and it seems like they're only. Uh, possibility for transition to adulthood is marriage so marriage is something very important for them it's it's vital for this transition to to adulthood um so we had the possibility of discussing uh gender and youth issues together uh in our in our research and based on our uh previous research that we have been conducting since the last 10 years, we have also published in Turkish studies uh, a journal or article discussing uh, the gender of the need category uh, in in Turkey. Uh, And I think uh, the advantage and the strength of Anegret's work uh, is that she is also trying to shed light on the high school students or the age category of uh, high school students uh, between 15 to 19 years old, which um, most of us uh, in fact, do not know much about uh, because most of the youth research in Turkey is focusing on uh, above 18 age category because it's much more easier for ethical reasons uh, so that we don't need to have the consent of the parents. We don't need to work with the ethics, et cetera. Um, And also uh, she demonstrates how uh, the high school students, again, there is this heterogeneity. Uh, so there is this difference between uh, being a student in a private high school and being a student in a vocational high school. She demonstrates the differences between different neighborhoods. Uh, but she also works with young people who are outside of the education and employment. And this has recently been discussed in the Turkish media. You have uh, seen the reports or 
uh, the newspaper articles discussing Evgenji uh, because they also underline that there are also young men. Uh, uh, so either we talk about Evgenji or underline the gender aspect of it and talk about Evkazi. Um, we are in fact talking about inequalities and we are talking about hierarchies. Um, and in that sense, it was very important uh, that you mentioned mentioned them, uh, Annegret, and thank you for the question, Dugu. Uh, I think it is very uh, valuable uh, that we discuss that category. So now uh, it's up to you, Annegret, to, to answer the question. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I mentioned uh, your study on Ev Kuzlerud because yeah, it's it's such an important category, and and thanks to you, this is also it's it's now a concept and it's in the discussion because, like you said, it's, or there are specific uh, youth who are more in the awareness of uh, society, who are more accessible for researchers, which is of course the youth who are at school or who can have some youth culture and present themselves and. Yeah, I have the feeling that it was also interesting to to uh, to hear from you that it's not so easy maybe to access um, youth in in high schools or then you have private channels. But in the end, it's also like if you make a state of the art of youth in Turkey, you rather have than middle class youth because are the ones who are represented in uh, in universities where you can access them easily. So. Yeah, F, studies like F are very valuable, but also very challenging. That was also the case for me when I was looking for young people out of school to make a group discussion. It took, took me such a long time because they're not reachable. I cannot talk to a fellow um, um, friend who is involved in youth work or who's a teacher who could give me contacts. It's, and then, for instance, I, I didn't include this group in, in, in the research, but what I did is I went um, out of Istanbul to the, to the outskirts, to a little village. I, next, it's near the Black Sea. I, I forgot where it is. And I got a contact to, to, to a girl in this village, and I wanted to, to find some time with her and her friends to talk. And it was like, I think it was in August, so it was the time of uh, Dune, of weddings, it was the time of Kishlik, <laughs> like, and, and I spent two days and it, it was not possible to bring uh, her friends and herself together for more than 15 minutes, because they're in their home, they're, they help their parents or in the kitchen then of course there is doing the wedding in the school there was in the schoolyard where everyone was out i think that's the possibility then also to mingle but then the parents just allowed me to uh, talk with them for 15 minutes in a pastane and they were, and then they had to leave so i couldn't even make a group discussion so yeah you have to spend much more time to find youth or and also then I realized by like the interviews or the group discussions I had that it's maybe also easier for young people from vocational schools or high schools to talk about what they do. It's easier for them to reflect and express it. So I had these group discussions, and but then I thought it would have been much better actually to do ethnography because I would have learned much more about their everyday life practices and not just by telling them. So I think you also need different approaches and then this also costs more time. But I, I mean, I would, if anyone is interested in doing this uh, research, I would highly encourage you to um, pursue something like that. It's, it's more work, but I think there's also a very high reward in doing it. By the way, Demet's uh, article uh, on Ev Kızı, Ev Kızları uh, is very a uh, good piece of work, uh, and I was assigning it uh, for our social certification class, and it is uh, it, it also presents lots of narratives, a very lo uh, lovely piece uh, to see their perspectives and uh, all those representations and connections between gender and. Uh, youth, uh, just just to remind you. <laughs> <that>. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's, it's good to hear that people are reading the work. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's almost three. Uh, thank you very much. It was lovely to have you. Very nice, inspiring talks and discussions and very uh, nice to hear uh, about your work a little bit more and be with you. Uh, thanks. Thank you all uh, the audience for their contributions, their uh, questions. Uh, thanks. All maybe Edith or other people can uh, would like to say something as well. Uh, but it was very a nice afternoon and post uh, let's say post pandemic <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and not let's say uh, post uh, semester for us for the faculty it, this is our last uh, week of, of the class classes uh, so it was very uh, nice to have you with us thanks thank you very much <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you, you for, again thank for the you. invitation um, um, and uh, yeah, giving us the opportunity to sh to share some insights and also like um, yeah, have this conversation. I mean, for me personally, I'm stuck in Germany, I, I, but I worked a lot on youth in Turkey, and for me, it's very special then also to discuss it with you and and see your yeah your few views and um, your perspectives on this topic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think, thank you so much for uh, starting this conversation, first with childhood uh, and then continue with you. So it is so precious and I'm so happy uh, to have the chance to uh, participate. So thank you for the uh, invitation. So I'm also hoping to, to host you in Istanbul at uh, at our department, but I also look forward to uh, coming to Izmir as well. Uh, so mm -hmm. thank you all. Uh, and thank you uh, to all those uh, who have addressed their uh, questions and to, to the audience, having heard that it's the last week of uh, the exams, uh, it should be a very tiring week. So thank you for participating. Thank you. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs> bye bye.